Right, so um, welcome everybody uh, to the uh, Strategy Cafe. Um, uh, uh, good morning, uh, my name is Nick Mayhew and I'm your barista for the day, bringing you practical leadership ideas with the hope of inspiring and stimulating you for the day, day ahead. Um, um, try and stay around uh, towards the end if you can. It's a 30-minute uh, um, interview today with some um, uh, summary at the end and um, time for questions, um, but if you, if you can stay around, we'll, we'll field some of those questions towards the end. We may run over by just a few minutes, but we should be done around about nine o'clock this morning. If you do have to go early, um, check back uh, on the uh, website, which is uh, the reference here, is where you registered. Uh, so you, you'll be able to get the slides, be able to listen to the rest of the cafe, um, and register for upcoming events uh, Events there. So we hope you love our blend of strategy and leadership, and if so, um, please let your friends know um, about us, get them to sign up. Um, so um, this is the, uh, the program for this morning, and um, I'm delighted today to get you started with your first shot uh, of the day, which is um, uh, Professor David Dunaway. Uh, David leads the um, paediatric craniofacial surgical team at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Uh, hello, David. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, everything's good. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully everybody can hear us. Please fire your questions in, in the questions area or send a chat if there's a, a problem and we'll try and get that fixed. But um, David, welcome to the cafe. Really, really pleased to have you on this morning. Uh, maybe you could just um, tell us a little bit about yourself just to get us going. Sure. Um, well, well, I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon, and my main interests in my job are uh, craniofacial surgery and particularly facial deformity. I lead the uh, craniofacial unit at uh, Great Ormond Street, and I've been a consultant uh, for about 20 years now. As well as having a practical interest in surgery, I have a keen interest in clinical and translational research, and that particularly relates to the form of the face and its function and issues around improving outcome. I'm now a professor of craniofacial surgery at uh, University College London and I'm at, based at the Institute of Child Health uh, where I head up the face value team that look, is looking into a number of craniofacial issues. In addition to that, I'm also a director of 152 Harley Street Limited, which is a, an independent uh, uh, medical facility where we've concentrated on bringing those things that are very good about the NHS to the, uh, um, to the independent sector. Uh, and along with that, I'm director of the London Craniofacial Unit, which is a, an organization that I set up with my uh, neurosurgical colleague, Oase Jilani, to allow us to provide that uh, multidisciplinary framework for those patients that come to us internationally. Probably your, uh, probably your, um, your, uh, the audience today don't know. Um, I mean, the absolutely amazing things that you and uh, and Oase and and the teams there have have done. I mean, I, there's there's so many things I think that you've done which are incredible. But um, uh, I was absolutely amazed um, to have a look at some of the videos and hear about the separation of conjoined twins, which uh, which. Um, you know, it's kind of right up there. I think you've done two of the seven successful separations. Is that right? Yeah, that's indeed. So we're particularly interested in uh, conjoined twins, craniopagus twins. That uh, those are twins that are joined at the head, and they have uh, uh, lots of extra challenges because the blood supplies to their brains are are joined, and they require a slightly different approach. And so that's where our particular expertise lies. And uh, these are very, very rare cases, but uh, the team has had the opportunity to separate uh, two sets now, both of which have been uh, very successful, and I think we've done it in an innovative and safe way. I, I, I uh, want to come back to that because, um, you know, it's kind of a good way of summarizing the, uh, the, the, the sort of leadership uh, and innovation that you have achieved. But, um, it was a huge privilege, and I was very grateful that you invited me to come along to your inaugural lecture um, at ICH. And um, 
I, I think we were talking about it afterwards so I was with your team, I was kind of blown away with the, um, with the innovation that's been involved in this. So maybe just tell us a little bit about that, how you, how you got started on this and about how the innovation has evolved over the years. Yeah, so craniofacial surgery is about um, essentially surgery of uh, anomalies of the face and cranium, uh, so most of it is uh, congenital anomalies, and it's, a, it's essentially a rare set of rare conditions that uh, uh, require an interface between different specialities. So, um, and key to that are neurosurgery and the plastic and reconstructive surgery that goes along with the face, but also many other things, different surgical disciplines, an understanding of the physiology, the psychology that uh, affects uh, people as they change their appearance, and the kind of support that children need within the uh, uh, community to go through these types of uh, procedure. So in order to establish a, uh, a team that can do that, you need to bring all of those specialists together and find them uh, a way of working and communicating well. And I think that perhaps is where uh, the key leadership um, uh, role comes in here, in that uh, in some way you have to find all these very, get all these very individualistic people together and get them to work in an environment where they can uh, uh, learn and grow from one another. And actually, the innovation uh, that is required in this type of, uh, of uh, speciality, I think, really comes at the interface between all of those specialities. So there's nothing terribly unique about what we do, but it's how we put it together that uh, I think makes it innovative. I think that's so funny. Um, uh, you, you also, we were talking about this the other day, I know, when you were chatting about um, face, face shape. Um, and there's quite a lot there. So, it's, I mean, uh, we were chatting about um, how to change the shape of faces. Um, just got this um, image up of, um, of Stefan and, um, you know, a kind of a great view of how uh, you're able to help him. This is from Think of Mirror article about him. And I believe this guy, is, you know, he's a UK trooper from Bosnia who um, helped this, uh, this young lad get, get help. But, um, yes. He, um, there's a lot. There's a lot there, isn't there? So this concept of how do you change the shape of a face, and it, and it kind of really inspired me to think about. Uh, you were saying you you know topology, topography, um, orthodontistry. Um, there's material science in there. There's data analytics in there. Give us some. Give us some idea of that kind of wider breadth beyond um, like what you might consider to be purely medical, and uh, you know why all that. Is, how how is that relevant? So I, I, I guess really um, we have a number of set procedures that we can do and are well established in uh, the medical field. But if you go back to the basics of, uh, of being able to change the shape of somebody's spatial form, we actually really don't understand in any great detail um, what it is. What is the shape of a face and how do we need to change it to improve it? And so. One of the areas that we've been particularly interested in is studying uh, what makes up a face. And uh, I mean, it's, that is in itself is not a, a, a new science by any means and probably started in the Renaissance with uh, uh, leaders like Dürer and Leonardo da Vinci who started to measure um, uh, the face and try and get some idea of the overall facial form. Yeah, yeah. It worked extremely well for what they wanted to do as artists, but actually it's not really so useful for us as surgeons because we need to be able to understand the face in much more detail. And we also need to be able to understand the constraints that uh, anatomy needs to uh, that puts on us because we can't make um, the, all of the changes that we want to there anatomically impossible. And that's been one of the strands of our research at the Institute of Child Health. It's interesting, isn't it? Because you were talking to me about that and also about the need to make the, um, the bones actually change shape. So some of it is about, um, is about um, surgery and reshaping. Other, other bits of it are about encouraging the, um, the, the right shape to come. Um, yes. And borrowing from orthodontistry, for example, and then mapping it with topology and topography. It's kind of quite interesting crossover. Yes, indeed. And I think, it's, again, that's another example of uh, where the really interesting and innovative ideas come uh, where 
different disciplines and uh, specialities uh, uh, come together. And so in our research team, uh, we've been involved in, in terms of facial shape with looking at with working with computer scientists, with engineers, uh, with orthodontists, as you explained, who understand a lot about uh, how to change the intraoral environment. And I think one of the key contributions that we perhaps made is um, getting together with those uh, computer scientists. And we ran a project in 2012 at the London Science Museum where we engaged with the public and allowed, and they volunteered to give the 3D form of their faces, which we collected with our 3D cameras. And we've made a statistical model of the uh, human face, which has been incredibly useful to us in understanding the problems that we have. So from understanding the face, shape of the face in a very simple way, we now have a statistical model that carefully uh, maps the face, we understand what the average face looks like, we understand what the variation in the normal population is and how people with different syndromes and conditions differ from that normal population. And uh, we borrowed uh, expertise from the computer science world, the imaging world of uh, CGI and from simple things like cartography, how you describe the earth in a map uh, feeds absolutely into how you describe a human face. It is just another modified sphere, really. And so all of these things have come together and have allowed us to uh, understand things uh, in a much, much more complex way uh, through um, uh, computer models. It's a, I mean, it's a kind of, a kind of um, really exciting um, piece of work that uh, incredible database. And um, you were you were telling us in the um, in the in the lecture about I think I've got this right that you can so you can you can get a sense of how this face is varying from what its norm should be. So there's a sort of presupposition that you can delve into the database, put some detail in about this person, and it will come back and tell you what their normal face would have looked like. Is that right? For their age and their ethnicity, etc. Uh, yeah, I, I could could have looked like uh, you. So you can normalise them. All of our faces uh, vary, and what, I guess one of the things is that you know most research into facial form has looked at the average face, and none of us have uh, an average face. Uh, and so if you kind of model your surgical plans on making everybody look average, there's a lot of work to do to everybody. So there's something fundamentally wrong with that way of looking at a face. And so yeah. this model allows us to look at how faces vary. So we all vary from in that there is normal variation within uh, a population and basically that is the noise within normal facial form. But he, people who have specific conditions have that normal variation as well, but they also have um, something that is very specifically due to that syndrome. And so if you have a statistical model, then you can extract what that variation due to their syndrome is. And you can do it in other ways as well. So you can define ethnicity and you can define the changes that happen with age. So once you have a powerful um, a statistical model like this, then you are able to make changes uh, and understand how things move in order to, I don't really like the word normalize, but to bring people within that, perhaps that, uh, that uh, average cloud of uh, how that we would perceive as somebody is looking, you know, as just part of the general population. So it's a lovely, a lovely phrase, the, uh, the the face cloud. And I guess what you're doing there is you're you're using your 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 uh, AI, your computer, um, your your search capabilities and algorithms to search for um, a, a series of images which are are relevant to this person and gives them a um, gives you and them a sort of a, a smaller range of um, possible changes, visions for yeah. themselves. Like that, that would make sense to them that they can choose from, uh, or you can choose from in terms of how to approach helping. Um, yeah, yes. so, uh, sorry. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I guess that's right. I mean, um, I 
the statistics of it describe what we might achieve, but I think that, yeah, uh, you know, these are such complex computational things that we don't really, we can't really understand them as people. So um, basically what the machine will do is give us um, a, a variety of uh, changes that we can make. We can look at which ones are anatomically possible, and then we get a, a very clear idea about how exactly we need to change the topography of the facial bones and the soft tissues that overlie them to achieve a result. But um, the, that part of it is very much done uh, as a computational model, and but it has to be at the end of it kind of rehumanized. And we, so there is very much a, a, a human factor of working out what would be the right thing to do at the end of it. For, for this for this child and considering this child's needs this child's life uh, his yeah. his or her possibilities ahead for um, yeah. achieving, achieving what might be called a normal life having having um, adult relationships having a family perhaps having a having a successful career and a meaningful life not being discriminated against in some way um, so that that realization I think is um, really interesting and kind of a lovely a lovely comment. I, fa I but found this. Oh, yeah. So I was going to say that is only one part of it, really. Giving somebody a more normal face is only a, a part of having a normal life. And so somewhere yeah. that needs to fit into uh, how you look after people who are challenged by their appearance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, this, this next slide is like a big team. Um, um, so um, one of the things we haven't really talked about in, in all of this is like um, face shape, uh, change, um, you know, um, materials that change shape and the material science involved in creating, uh, creating things for the face. But there's some material scientists, there's some engineers in this group, as well as the, the medics yeah. and the mathematicians. And tell us a little bit about how, how do you collect a team like this to do this stuff? You know, what's the... What are the leadership principles around creating a group like this? Okay, well this is a great picture. It's part of the face value team at, uh, at uh, the Institute of Child Health. And within that team, you can see that there are uh, uh, surgeons, there are PhD students that both come from the engineering and medical world. Uh, there are engineers there, there are computer scientists there. Uh, and uh, uh, there are material scientists. So um, within that team, there's this tremendous cross-discipline that allows us to, uh, to make our research happen. And uh, it's really a very fruitful team in uh, uh, generating new ideas and lines of research. So how do you go about bringing them together and making that team work with such a multidisciplinary life? Oh, well, I, I think, uh, first of all, you need a goal that you're all signed up to, and I think the problems that we have are interesting to all of those people, albeit in different ways. Um, I, it's a kind of difficult team to lead in a way in that you nobody's really in a position to understand it all. I don't think you can be too didactic about how you direct things, and so I think being a leader in this situation is creating, it's really much more about creating an environment in which people can work together and encouraging them uh, or giving them the opportunities to, to grow within that team towards a common goal. So, and I, I guess that probably is part of leadership generally. It's, um, it's defining what those goals are that everybody can sign up to and then creating the environment by which everybody can perform to the maximum. Oh, and, and, and this team this team really are right. So it kind of takes us forwards to the, um, uh, the, the, the really, really challenging operations like the, um, the conjoined twins. Uh, I mean, you, you, were, you were telling me that you have to do, uh, you know, it's a series of procedures over time. Each procedure has to be carefully done so that you don't create too much of a, a, a damage for the, for the children that they can recover from. So it's step by step by step by step until eventually you have that final procedure where you can separate them and then you have two teams with all of this incredible specialism um, handling two children and bringing them through that in, in one piece as it were. 
um, the challenges of that yeah. just seem immense um, and, uh, you know, kind of really exciting, but also very scary. So, you know, how do you get to that? How do you get to that sort of world-class capability? Um, well, I think you need the team for there first. So you need to have created that surgical team with its support that has all of the capability to um, undertake and plan a very complex procedure like this. Um, and then you need to look very carefully at what has gone be before you. So when the first uh, set of twins we um, uh, separated was some time ago, and you can see Professor Hayward, second from the left in that picture, who led the neurosurgical aspects of that, uh, of that separation. So we together looked around the world and, and looked at how people had separated craniopagus twins in the past. And most people had separated them in one big heroic operation that took somewhere between 20 and 30 hours. And the mean mortality was about 50%. So um, either, you know, one or both twins would die in many of those operations. And it became wow. quite clear that um, there was a, there's a fundamental problem with doing everything together because it's too much of an insult to the, to the brain to, uh, to survive. And so we looked around and we found that people had tried it in a staged way, uh, particularly a group in New York, and we went and they came and talked to us and we worked out how we would do this. And so the key to us was actually working out a strategy which would uh, allow us to gradually separate the twins over a number of operations, uh, but causing the least insult each time. So we did things very gradually, uh, and it stressed the viability of the skin over the scalp, and it stressed the viability of the brain, but not so much that it couldn't recover from it. And it was a matter of putting all of those things together in such a way that we would be able to defend against any problem that happened. So it was very much that kind of overall strategy that allowed us to uh, separate these twins. And I think these our twins have been the first that have been separated without any sign of, uh, of uh, neurological damage. So this is a very validated way of doing it. Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. So I think the other thing about it is that you, if possible, you shouldn't try completely new things. It's a matter of putting together tactics that uh, you're familiar with in a slightly different way to uh, achieve a very different goal. I remember you saying that um, it was um, uh, really process innovation. So everything in the, um, in the operation had been done before, but you uh, were organizing the order of things and the staging and timing of things. But also anything can go wrong, so everybody has to be absolutely on top of their game. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's, there are technical challenges here. I think that whole idea of process innovation is very good, that we've taken a number of building blocks, which are procedures and steps that we do every day, and then put them together in a different order. So we have a very different process, but it's made up of things that are very routine and straightforward for us. So there was no single step that was um, uh, particularly challenging or worrying, but the whole thing put together was a very new experience for us. But I, you're absolutely right. It's um, the whole team needs the work, and the you know particularly the challenges of anaesthesia uh, for two joined children uh, whilst they go through this separation is uh, is key. And we're very lucky that at Great Ormond Street, although craniopagus, this particular type of conjoinedness, is very rare, we can we have a team of uh, anaesthetists and physicians that are able to support many other types of conjoinedness. So we could again build on that expertise that was already there in this uh, great institution. I love the fact that we're talking about something so, like most of us listening to this would think that's just way beyond anything we could even conceive of doing. But I think that when you talk about, you know, um, 20 years of step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step change, um, from, and we didn't talk about it today, but like a, a facial diagram on a computer that was 20 points to this new thing which you talk about as the face cloud, which uh, you can kind of search with AI. Um, no one great leap forward, but um, lots and lots of little steps. It's, um, 
and then just everyone practicing and being at their best on the day and ready for the challenge and that level of pushing that level of challenge to really sort of optimize uh, the capabilities from the team. There's some great lessons. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna try and wrap up with sort of key lessons from this. And we've got some good questions coming through. So if the audience are out there wanting to fire in some questions, we're gonna take a couple of questions in a bit. But thank you very much, for David. For now, I'll come back come back to you in a sec. So um, so just uh, for me, you know, how do we translate that into back into our businesses? There's just a few things which I think um, really stood out for me from from the interview with David. So some the top ones, great ideas coming from different fields. Um, you see that uh, in business all the time, it's like in, you know, get stuck in the thinking about what are the benchmarks and norms for our industry and our sector. And often the best ideas, these problems have been solved in other sectors, but we just don't look there. And this idea that in order to really understand the face, you know, you need to think about uh, material science, anthropology, topology, topography, lots of different ways of thinking about things to generate ideas um, from outside of the, the norm in order to generate that, that, that change. And then David talks about there being no great leap forward. So, you know, um, a facial model with 20 landmarks back in the 80s that would take maybe a day or so to make um, to, you know, a database of um, statistical Googleized face cloud um, items, which gives you a, a way of searching possibilities for people. Um, I love that uh, concept that innovation can happen on the day. So um, yes, you've got to be very, very highly organized, but you also have to have that flexibility in innovation, that agility in your multidisciplinary approach to handle what's going to happen. And when you create that right environment and you don't you know, push too hard to lead too strongly, but allow people to um, play to their strengths and give them an overall goal, um, and they get to practice that. Um, so this practicing until you're in your innovating point is really powerful. Um, then amazing things can happen. And then I love this um, underlying values that come through. Um, dealing with real people, the analytics must be rehumanized. Constant attention to how we can do things better for children. You know, how do we bring together superb people and create an environment where they can grow? That's a great statement. And David, uh, in talking to me before, it's just, you know, don't really like that phrase. It's not really about ugliness or normality. It's just really about trying to find a way forwards for the person that works. Um, I've got a lovely question here uh, for you, David. So do you have an ultimate objective? Something that, um, you know, um, once achieved will cause you to think you've achieved all there is to achieve? Uh, I think I've come to realize that there is, you know, it's. Uh, the whole business of human endeavor is a constant leap forward. But for me, I think if I, in terms of my research, if I could really make this computerized model a standard usable thing, and actually creating some devices that we didn't talk about how we are now limited by the surgery um, rather than our understanding of the face, to actually produce some real devices that would enable us to improve the quality of the surgery that we do and do things in a much more subtle, sophisticated way that is less dangerous for yeah, people yeah, yeah. undergoing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this would be great, amazing objectives. I've got another question here, which is, um, so what, what do you think is the key uh, to securing buy-in within such a diverse team? Um, I think you all have to have a, a, a common goal um, or within the team so that people are working together, they're really signed up uh, to what you're doing and they see the value in it. Uh, but it's also very important to look at people's own objectives in life and uh, it's very important as a leader to support the growth and development of people within your team so that they can go on and have uh, great careers and build their career, whatever level that may be, from you know, uh, an MSc student to somebody who's looking to set out on their own and do their own great research. So they feel like they are having a meaningful life as well as having a meaningful, let's call it a business objective. Um, yeah. yeah, I think so. It's very important that whatever business that you're in that people should see the value of it and and work towards a goal uh, and there has to be constant progress uh, and as a leader you need to 
help people to see that and you need to make help them make it a reality both for themselves and the whole team. I think that's wonderful. So look, I'm going to wrap up at that point and say thank you very much and thank you very much to the audience for listening in. I've just got a couple of summary slides and then we're done for the day. There are a few more questions on there. People are sort of um, chipping in and saying thank you and brilliant content and um, etc. So thank you very much for all those content, uh, uh, comments. They're really, really appreciated and um, with other questions coming through, we'll try and come back to you and answer them uh, after, the, after the session. But thank you very much, David. Absolutely brilliant. So just um, push out to the audience just before you um, slip off back to your, your desks. Um, how can you apply these ideas in your role? Just think back through what David has said. I mean, it's an absolutely amazing team, achieve incredible things. But really just, you know, step by step, uh, having a common goal, bringing all the disciplines together, making sure everyone's really practiced, that right level of challenge that's up there and also looking after the lives of the team members as well. Some fantastic stuff in there. Uh, which one thing are you going to act on out of that? I think all of that is applicable to all of our businesses. Um, and we hope to um, engage you with other things, so um, come back and have a look up on our website to um, hear the other Strategy Cafe webinars that we've done. So you've got uh, one on profit there, one on motivation team effectiveness with Chris Highland, Nikki's one around breathing life into the brand, Dr. Amina's wonderful one on overcoming self-doubt and moving forward to become the real you. Um, David's stuff will be up there shortly. Um, you can come and listen to the, um, uh, the audio files and watch the slides uh, up online and register for future events. And the next edition, so mark your diaries now, please. I'd love to have you there, 17th of August, 8.30. We're calling it the beach edition because it's over the summer, so it's iced coffee next time around. And the plan is everyone comes back, so those we've interviewed for the last few months uh, join us for a panel discussion around key themes and priorities, and if you want you can post in questions beforehand which we can tackle. So we'll ask for that from people who are registered and signed up, but please come back on the 17th. And then one final note in September, there'll be our next London Leaders Forum for Directors, and we're going to launch an Executive Leaders Forum, which is for, for those uh, senior leaders in, in business, um, and uh, in other walks of life who are not running the company but have major responsibilities. So there's going to be a new uh, network forum for you uh, to join. Uh, so um, ask us a little bit more about that. And um, uh, Professor Dunaway has kindly agreed to come to the uh, Directors Leader Forum to give us the keynote and to elaborate on some of these issues. So if you want to meet him and hear more about that amazing journey in person, then, then sign up for the, uh, the Directors forum meeting in September. Date's going to come around uh, shortly. Thank you very much for coming today. Hope you really enjoyed it and um, look forward to seeing you again on the uh, Beach Cafe on the 17th of August. Hope you have a great day.